We honor our Nevada Woman of Achievement, Diana Eden, for her over 30 years for her over 30 year career as an Emmy nominated costume designer working in film, television, and theater. While her career achievements are stellar, we are also recognizing her for her numerous contributions to our community. I personally have witnessed Diana generously give back by teaching her craft at UNLV, both in the film and theater departments, mentoring numerous students, and being a constant support of our local organizations like the Nevada Women's Film Festival and CineFEMS, our organization for women in film. When looking for a quote to encapsulate Diana's contributions, I found one by Maya Angelou about baseball that seems strangely fitting. She said, quote, I've learned that you shouldn't go through life with a catcher's mitt on both hands. Sometimes you need to be able to throw something back. Diana has definitely thrown some back, and for that we are eternally grateful. Maybe this is because Diana received an Emmy nomination for costume design for A League of Their Own, a television series about a woman's baseball team that she knows a thing or two about catcher's mitts. We are also very grateful to have Carrie Kaufman, host producer of KMPR's State of Nevada, here with us tonight to conduct an interview with Diana. I've seen Carrie, and she deserves a round of applause for Carrie. I've seen Carrie in action and you're in for a treat. She's a very talented interviewer and selflessly donated her time here tonight to help us celebrate Diana's achievements. These two women are huge assets to our community and it's an honor to bring them up here tonight. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Diana Eden and Carrie Kaufman. So I want to uh, start, I'm just going to start off asking questions here. Yeah. I want to start off with, you walked in today, yes. and you said, ask my friends, I had a really, really hard time figuring out what to wear. <laughs> and I'm like, but you're a costume designer. I, I don't like, I don't, and, and it also occurred to me that, that most of the time when, I, when I've met costume designers, yeah. like in a production meeting or whatever, yeah. they're the most interestingly dressed people in the room. Oh, and it, it occurred to me that that's a, like a, a real pressure every day when you have to like go to a meeting or go work with other costume designers, you have to impress. Well, I don't know if I dress to impress. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was. I mean, I bothered all my friends here. They've all been my, you know, virtual stylists because I'm used to dressing other people. So I said, well, all right, for this event, I want to be glamorous, but, you know, humble, approachable. <laughs> um, I want to be artistic, but not bohemian, not too weird. You know, and I, I tend to wear a lot of color, and I try it on everything, and it, it just looked too weird. I don't know. So I said, well, you know, I want to be sexy, but I want to be safe. <laughs> you know? So for someone who wears all sorts of weird, bright things, here I am in a black dress. Got it. What are you most comfortable in day to day? Um, what, clo what do clothes say about you? I love... Dresses. I wear dresses more than pants. Um, I like long, flowy dresses, colorful things, comfortable but elegant. Yeah. So I've got notes here. I'm going to check my notes. Um, uh, <laughs> it so I'm reading about your career. Yeah. And it, it strikes me that you you did what you were you ended up doing in your life what you were supposed to do, but not necessarily what you wanted to do. And yeah. and I think a yes. lot of women go through that. Yes. Like oh, well, that's easy for me, so it yeah. must not be valuable. Um, is that what, 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 what mm. creating costumes was no, for you? I no, think, I think I fell into the career that I would have fallen into anyway, mm -hmm. but I started out being a dedicated ballet dancer. I mean, that's all I wanted to be. And then kind of graduated to um, acting, and I just thought I was going to be a performer for all of my life. Um, but, you know, sometimes the road zigs instead of zags, and you kind of have to go with it. And when you get to your mid-30s and you're still working only occasionally, and then you're still a waitress in a restaurant, you know, you say, hello, I think it's time to think about something else. So I never made that conscious decision, all right, 
I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to find something else. I actually met somebody at a party who um, was a producer for Anne Margaret for her big nightclub act up here in Vegas. Mm -hmm. And wonderful act with dancers and singers. And, and he said, you know, I'm looking for someone to coordinate the wardrobe for the dancers. So in my typically confident way, I said, oh, no, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, well, you were a dancer. You know what dancers need. Right. And that was my first job. And through that, um, oh, and it was so much fun coming up to Vegas and staying at Caesars when Caesars was a little... Um, and green. And green. And green. Yeah, and fountains. And, anyway, there was even a jacuzzi in my room. Wow. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, I digress. Um, through Anne Margaret, I met Bob Mackey, and he was about to start the design for Jubilee, um, the original Jubilee. Uh, sadly, no more. And he asked me to be his assistant on that. So. I just kind of fell into a world of costume, and the other career just kind of quietly, you know, went its way. So you brought up Bob, Bob Mackey. I got to ask you about him. Yeah. Um, talk to me about what he, what his influence was on you, and what he was like to work with and be around. Um, his influence was basically um, all my training in costume was at the, at the feet, if you will, of Bob Mackey. Mm -hmm. um, everything I learned, I didn't learn in school. I never went to college to train, which isn't, you know, which isn't to say don't go to college, but um, I learned by being at his side and seeing the big stars coming in and the way he fits and the way he chose and very, very much of a perfectionist, mm -hmm. which influenced me greatly. Um, I saw that as a designer, he took everything from the first meeting to the sketch to the execution to the placing of the beading to everything. And it had to be perfect. Did he design specifically for the person or did he design for the production? Well, it depends. I mean, for Cher, he designed for Cher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Carol Burnett. Right. And uh, in the 80s, every major star walked through that door. I mean, it was just, there wasn't a big star around that didn't come through the door to see Bob Mackey. Uh, but, you know, he, um, when he designed Jubilee, it was all about doing, you know, at the time, the biggest show ever, the highest budget, the most glamorous, gorgeous, um, fabulous Las Vegas show. So. so you've costumed things like Jubilee yeah. and Anne Margaret and, yeah. and lots of big Vegas productions. Yeah. Um, you've also costumed straight plays and musicals and, and, and TV shows and films that yes. have scripts to them. Yes. Tell me the difference between them. Ah, well, um, yeah, my bread and butter really has been television and film. And um, the script is everything. You start with the script. It, it gives you the story, the characters, and all the clues. And um, um, we just did a a kind of a project at UNLV uh, yesterday or the day before, I can't remember, where I had everybody take a script and just mark all the little clues that the writer is giving. Ah. Um, and uh, so that's where you start, and you go from there. But if it's not in the script, you know, you, you've, you've got to come up with something. So the, the, in the play production, in play production, the yeah. designers start working long before you have a cast, yeah. uh, you have a script. Yes, um, yes. Uh, so, so where do you start and, and where does, when the actor comes into the yeah. uh, equation, yeah. do things change? Yes. Okay, so oh, absolutely. they change? Well, I think it's, it's a collaboration of the writer's vision, the director's vision, because you have these conversations, mm -hmm. so you kind of have an idea um, obviously, research if it's a specific period or profession or something. But then the actor walks in the door, and now you have a real person who is going to wear that costume. You can't just say, okay, this is what I've designed, put it on. You know, I'm sure it'll fit, it'll be great, I designed it, you know. <laughs> it's the character. Yeah, it's the character. It's, it's how I see the character. Right. No, it, it's a conversation, and of course it depends on the size of the role. You're not going to get into a detailed conversation if someone has a, a one-line part, right. you know. Mr. Jones is here to see you. You kind of, you know, 
get to put on what I suggest you put on. But for the rest, it's really a negotiation. <laughs> So yep. have you ever, has an actor ever come in and you've put the costume on that person and both of you are like, uh, no, and you've had to start from scratch? Absolutely. Okay, tell me when. Yeah. I'm gonna take this off, it's hot. Um, these lights. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't, I, I don't know if I, well, I did have an actress once who put on an outfit that I had brought in and she loved it, absolutely loved it. Um, and um, I looked at her and I thought, she is going to look like a house on camera. I can't. So I had to say to her, Ann Mira, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Did you catch that? Yes, I got that. Um, I can't let you wear that. It's just, I know you love it and it looks great in the dressing room, but it's not going to look good on camera. And she was actually fabulous. Um, but no, it's you bring the fitting room is where the magic happens, as far as I'm concerned. I love the fitting process because you've done the research, you've done the homework, you've done the shopping or the renting or whatever, you've gathered everything, and then the actor arrives and you start to see what works. And uh, a friend of mine designs, um, has designed a lot of films for Robert De Niro, and he says that Robert will try on. Endlessly, he will. If you bring in 300 shirts, he will try on all 300, and then finally one will say, "This, I think this works." I don't do a very good impression, so. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, and that's the process. You, you you see together what works, and and um, you know if it's the first time I'm working with an actor, sometimes the first fitting can be kind of, mm, we didn't quite hit it this time, but usually. By the second fitting, I've kind of got it, and I kind of know what's going to work. And then, you know, you do have a little dance that you do to make sure that they are happy, because the actor does have to be happy. They have to go in front of the camera. <clears throat> right. And or on stage. Or on stage. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And there's nothing worse than having an actor come out at, you know, 7 a.m. in the morning onto the film set ready to shoot and kind of, you see, him or her looking around going, oh, look what they made me wear. <laughs> you, know, you know that's going to be disaster. <laughs> so um, the actor has to feel that by the time the actor leaves the fitting room, that everybody's on board. So the actor isn't the only one who has to be happy, though. I mean, no. the, there's the director oh, yeah. who has a tremendous say in it. Yes. Talk to me about the difference between working with directors on television and film and working with directors on stage. Um, well, television is such a fast medium that very often the directors don't have time to really get into, especially um, episodic, um, episodic dramas. It's like doing a feature film every seven days, and they are busy with location scouting and casting and everything, so they don't get as involved. Um, feature films, yes, every single... Uh, costume goes by them for approval. And, and, and stage? Stage, um, yeah, the, the director um, will need to approve all of the costumes and sometimes he or she will come in during the process. Sometimes you'll have a dress parade, right? which I kind of hate because everybody comes out and then they look and it doesn't feel quite as organic, but you know, um, it's the way it's done. When a lot of times when I talk to designers, yeah. um, they talk about being able to communicate with each other and the director. Yeah. Um, have Have you ever worked on a show, in, in any medium, where that was really cooking? Where like if you could go back in time and this was the perfect thing that you yeah. ever worked on? Talk to me about that. Well, there was one director um, that I loved working with because he was so supportive of. Um, the below the line people. Um, and um, there was a wonderful interaction. And, and one time um, he said, Oh, how was so and so who was going to be guest starring on one of the episodes? And I said, eh, He was a bit of a pill. He kind of gave me a hard time, but you know, eh, we're okay. That director called <laughs> the poor guy's agent 
The poor guy had to come to, and apologize to me. Wow. And I said, wow, that doesn't happen very often. Usually the director says, ah, oh, make it work, make it work. We're behind schedule, you know, and we're paying them a lot of money, so make it work. You know, somewhere in the middle is very nice. It's when you have producers and directors who are supportive. What are you talking to your students about in terms of collaboration? Oh, wow, my favorite subject matter. <laughs> um, Oops, I just, uh, sorry. Did you lose your... Yeah, no, I just this? hit it. Yeah, oh, go ahead. okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not happy. I try and impress upon them. I did the same thing there you go. with my, there you go. my um, hubcaps here. You just here. blew out the eardrums of the yeah, sound people. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, how really, really collaborative film is. And um, I am so grateful to Francisco Menendez to uh, chair the film department for inviting me to come to his advanced directing class because I think that there's not nearly enough training for directing students um, in the other aspects. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you're a student and you're doing weekend shoots and you're borrowing each other's clothes and filming in somebody's apartment, you don't think about production designers and costume designers. And, and you know, it's all so integral. And so uh, one of my neck lectures um, a couple of weeks ago, I showed um, some scenes from Darkest Hour because, you know, you can't play Churchill without the costume. Right. I mean, you just can't. Um, and um, uh, I was able to get some clips about Gary Oldman talking about how important getting the fat suit that he had to wear, the shape of it right, and the stoop of the shoulders. And then once they had the fat suit right, then the designer had to come and create the costume on that and get it to fit right, so that by the time you see Gary as Churchill, he's Churchill. I mean, the stoop, the, I mean, I'm not saying the acting isn't part of it, but you also, you have to have the costume, you have to have the production design, the lighting, it, it all works together. Mm -hmm. And until you can all talk to each other and respect each other and not be territorial. Ah. Yeah, <laughs> important. <laughs> Actors will often say that they they don't know their character until they until they try on the costume. Yeah, and yeah. then suddenly it clicks for them. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully that's then we've done our job right. I mean, there's nothing that makes a costume designer happier than to have an actor say, "Oh, now I get it. Oh, now I I feel just wonderful in this, and now I can do the part." Then we go, "Oh, yes." <laughs> Very so you, satisfying. So you started here doing stage shows, doing, doing these really, you know, yeah. theatrical, uh, yeah. showy stage shows. Yeah. And then you go into television. You're yeah. doing episodic yeah. television. How did you get into television? Um, my first job as a designer, not as an assistant, because I worked five years um, as an assistant to Bob and to another designer who was... Uh, uh, Pete Menefee, who was also co-designer on Jubilee. I got an interview for the Facts of Life. And I didn't really know what the interview was going to be like. Um, but there was a wonderful woman who was a producer. And I went up. And she talked about having an all-female cast, five women in the lead. Uh, plus George Clooney, which wasn't too bad. Um, <laughs> very, very, very young. George very Clooney, young. With long hair, yeah. But still totally adorable. Um, and, um, and she talked about how difficult it was for these young women. They'd come to fame in their teens, and they were going through puberty and boyfriends and a lot of things. And... I, I was impressed by how much she seemed to really care about her actors. And then when I left, I thought, she doesn't really care if I'm that good a designer or not. She wants to find someone who can work with the girls. And I mean, believe me, you know, they had figure issues. And I don't mean issues negatively, but you know, you couldn't dress them all the same. They had 
different personalities. I mean, they, I love them. I mean, you know, and you have to love your actors a little bit. Mm -hmm. And um, we also had a leading lady, the uh, older actress, who you may or may not remember who I'm referring to, but she, she had come from Broadway and um, she required a lot of patience, <laughs> a lot of patience. So my first job, I mean, it was a woman who hired me, who gave me a break. And, you know, I, I also want to mention, as I was thinking about this interview, all of the big steps I've taken in my career, the next level, I would say 90% of them have been given to me by women, mm. which means they, they didn't do what a lot of men do, which is say, well, have you ever done an episodic drama before? Well, I don't see that you've done a feature before. Uh, the women who hired me took a chance on me. And I'll be forever grateful to all of them. So, um, <laughs> Jubilee. Yeah. A League of Their Own. Yeah. Similar shows. <laughs> um, like, like where, how do you go from that? Well, OK. Uh, because Jubilee, remember, I was an assistant. Right. I was learning. That's true. Um, I was not designing. And, um, um, but I knew after a couple of years that I didn't want to be an assistant forever. Um, and so I had to go out and start finding my way as a designer. And um, um, I did a number of small theater productions uh, in LA and then tried to promote my name as a designer on my own, not assistant. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, fortunately, um, somebody had observed me working and again had liked my work ethic, way with people, whatever, and recommended me uh, for Facts of Life. And uh, that's what got me started. And then that led to another, led to another, mm -hmm. led to another. So a, a, wo a woman comes to you and says, I want to be a designer. Yeah. Uh, what do you tell this 18, 20 year old woman who, who wants to go into the business yeah. and, and, and design for film and television? What is your first piece of advice? Um, study. Mm -hmm. I mean, go to, go to college. Um, it's, as I say, it is hard. Most US universities do not have film costume design programs. Um, there are some. I mean, uh, there are some in, in LA and there are some across the country, but there are few and far between. But I say at least go study in a theater program, learn how to, to draw and to cut and understand fabric and work with actors. Mm -hmm. And um, and then as far as moving into TV and film, it's kind of an apprenticeship. You just have to make yourself so, you know, obnoxious to someone that they just, you know, you say, I'll do anything. I'll pick up your cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> I'll house it for your cat. <laughs> so fun. People laughing because they know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, and, you know, you kind of learn on the job to be perfectly honest in yes. film. I know have you, that's... Have you recommended people, younger people, you know, to, to be the cat picker-uppers and the cleaning picker-uppers <laughs> or what have you? Two of my protégés are sitting right over there. <laughs> um, Amber Thompson, I first met um, in 2009, was it? Yeah. The um, UNLV was doing a co-curricular film and I was brought in as the head of the department, the designer, and then I was design, uh, assigned students. And this very quiet student came up and said, I've been assigned to you, and I'm very good at shopping and finding bargains. Ah. And the rest is history, because yes. I need you, but go ahead. Yeah. She <laughs> is the best. Well, by the end of Stealing Las Vegas, mm -hmm. she was Fabulous, the continuity, the working with actors, and every film I've done since then, I've said, Amber has got to be my assistant. I can't, I can't do a film without her. So I'm very proud of her, and I hope the Nevada film community, you know, is aware. Marta, on the other hand, I was... <laughs> I was on the uh, other hand... <laughs> assigned... On the movie The Trust, um, I was actually the assistant designer, but uh, the designer was in LA most of the time. So, 
And I was told, there's a PA that you just must take on. And I, oh, God. So Marta was assigned to me. And I didn't have a lot for her to do the first week. And I thought, what am I going to do with this girl? But anyway, by the end of the movie, she had wormed her way into my heart and has been there ever since and is doing great. And so both women are in the business and making me proud. And uh, I'm so glad for you both. So I want to talk to you about um, like doing, a, doing an episodic TV show. Yeah. There is, um, the, the characters don't change necessarily. They grow as the yeah. seasons go. Yeah. Do you, like, do you have, figure out a wardrobe for the character for the entire season? Uh, yeah. Do you do individual shows? Obviously, if, if costume is important for a show, yeah. if somebody comes in with a boutonniere, then yeah. you have to have that. Yeah. But, but how, do you, how do you approach well, that? Well, I mean, you build a closet for mm -hmm. the actor. Um, but, I mean, you're still doing new stuff every single week. Uh, but there are basics. I mean, even on the soaps, I had 21 actors working every day, and there's no way they could have completely new outfits every single time they worked. Mm -hmm. So you build up a closet, and they have their favorite pants or, you know, whatever. Um, and, yeah, there's an arc. But, I mean, let's face it, contemporary TV, I wouldn't say that the terribly serious arc mm -hmm. that's more for features that are really getting more involved. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I did two um, legal dramas, and uh, you know, the, the storylines have to be wrapped up in, in what, 52 minutes mm -hmm. of airtime. So, uh, you know, you have to work very, very fast, and uh, you kind of have to know what you're doing because. You're spending a lot of money. You're dealing with a lot of actors. You're working long hours, mm -hmm. and you, you never get a rest. <laughs> so take us through the process. Something, uh, somebody pitches a story. Yeah. Uh, that they, they want to make a pilot. Yeah. Where do you come into that process? Um, the produce once the obviously the network has to buy it <laughs> right, and right, all right. that, <laughs> um, and then the um, producers are hired. The producers hire the. Um, department heads, the creatives, the uh, costume designer, production designer, um, DP, editor, music, the five departments. Mm -hmm. And so I usually come in for uh, sitcoms. I come in and meet with the producer. And uh, they either hire me or they don't. And uh, usually it all happens very quickly. It, I mean, one of the tough things about <laughs> working in the business is you're always hustling for the next job. Mm -hmm. There's almost no such thing as a full-time job because, you know, you do a TV series and you have a season and then it doesn't get picked up and you're back to square one. So every August I'd be saying, oh, God, I'm never going to work again, you know. And um, then I get a phone call and, yeah, can you come in and meet with me? I'm doing a new series with Betty White and, and uh, you know, yeah, I'll be there. Uh, can you come in tomorrow at 11? Yeah. And then, you know, by Monday you'd be working. Right. So. And yeah. then the writer's room. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, things, are, things change a lot in the writer's room. Yeah. And you've got a costume, what they're writing. Yeah. And sometimes they're walking in the day, the, the, you yeah. know, the, the moment before they're shooting yeah. with, a, with a new yeah. script. How do you deal with that? <laughs> Well, you have to do. <laughs> I once had a writer come up to me. We were already halfway through taping. I swear to God, this is true. And he said to me, for the last, can you come up with a giant cockroach costume? <laughs> I said, no. This Are was for a TV show? Or a for TV a show, a sitcom. And they had this great idea that maybe, you know, Deborah Messing in the last scene will come out dressed as a cockroach. I don't know. But anyway, I said, no, I can do a lot of things, but not that. Not that in three days. In, in like day. three hours. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, so uh, what was the hardest thing you've ever costumed? What was the thing that stumped you the most? Oh, whoa, she knows. <laughs> Who's laughing? I am. <laughs> And what are you thinking? The rat story. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, I actually, I, I've actually costumed quite a few animals <laughs> um, who have appeared in shows. And Deborah remembers. 
<laughs> that in one sitcom, they, they had a, um, a rat. And it was one, no, it was a soap opera, I think. And the character um, had gone out with this guy, and she thought he was a rat, and then he appears as a rat. Mm -hmm. So they, they said to me, well, how, you know, how are we going to know that it's the guy is now the rat? Can you dress him the same? So I said, well, I don't know. I can try. Now, a rat, you may not realize that when it's like this, it's kind of round. But the moment it stretches out, it's very long. So anyway, I actually, the rat wrangler brought the rat up, and I did make a little outfit for him. So, <laughs> anyway, I, I don't know if that was the hardest job. I don't know if I really can come up with the hardest job. I, I love all my jobs. So, I mean, some of the difficulties is having the stamina, uh, especially as I get older, mm -hmm. um, for film. I mean, a 14-hour day is the norm. It really is. And I've worked, uh, I did four days on uh, film here in, in Las Vegas, um, Step Up 5. Mm -hmm. Ooh. I worked 16 hours, 14 hours, 14 hours, and 18 hours in a row. And uh, Drove on my way driving home. I turned at um, Las Vegas Boulevard and, and the Aria, and I turned into oncoming traffic. I mean, that's that is how exhausted you get. Mm -hmm. So the film uh, world is really hard work physically. And this year, young, and it doesn't mean anything. But um, um, I haven't been that young in a while, so that's difficult. Um, there have been a couple of sitcoms where I've had really difficult actors and it made it a real pain to come in and work because you know that this one actor was just going to give you a hard time. But generally speaking, I, because I love the work so much, uh, I love it all. So that's a, a good thing about it, not being necessarily a, a permanent job. Yeah. You, if you have somebody that's hard to work with, yeah. you don't have to work with them for that long. Right. Yeah. I mean, most TV, well, TV seasons are shorter now. I mean, right. on Facts of Life, we did 22 episodes um, a year, and then we went on hiatus in May um, and came back in August. A um, lot of, because they're so expensive now, mm -hmm. um, and that kind of format is different. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, um, if you work on a film, you're probably working six weeks, and then it's over. If you're working on a TV series, it can be one season or two seasons or, you know. But yeah, it's not like you've got a, a mean boss that you're stuck with for life. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you think going in might be hard that turned out to be really fantastic or, or even the opposite? Hmm. Well, I was just scared shitless when I started. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you're hired, and you, you, all of a sudden you've got all these people, and you've got to costume them and please them, and, and I'd never done it before. I mean, I was a nervous wreck for the first three, four episodes of The Facts of Life. And, um, and then, oh, another thing that's so scary is in a sitcom, you've got all of these writers, You've got a lot of producers at various different levels, mm -hmm. associate producer, showrunner, executive producer. Then you have the production company, Columbia or Sony, whatever. And then you have the network. So you have a note session after you do your dress rehearsal and you've got everybody does a run through the show in costume with camera blocking and everything. Then you go up to this room, and these tables and chairs are set up, and there's like 20 executives mm -hmm. or producers who are all giving notes. That was absolutely terrifying, um, because you know some of them say really dumb things. <laughs> like, you know, I, I love Blair's dress, but could it be pink? You know, and you're saying we're taping the show in three hours? Right. No, it can't be pink. Right. Um, you know. So, um, but that was... A pink cockroach, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, right, there you go. So that was scary. Um, 
And I mean, when you're starting out, it's all scary. Mm -hmm. it's, it's always scary. But then, you know, you do get experience. And um, I mean, if I were to start a new film tomorrow, I would be scared. But then I would get into it, and I'd have a good first fitting, and I'd say, yeah, yeah, I can do this. Yes, yes, I'm in the sweet spot. I know it. OK, so you sit down with the script. You get a new yep. film tomorrow. You're going to yep. sit down with the script yep. and, uh, and read the script, obviously. Take notes. Yes. Um, and then what's your next process? You start drawing? No. Um, well, there's a lot in film. There's, um, there's so many characters, and there's so many scenes, and there's so much continuity be in, to be involved with that you do a very detailed breakdown. Mm. And it's a cross plot. And, and you have to figure out this character in this scene, and then the next scene, and then these characters, and then it's a new day, and then this and this. So it's a lot of organization first. Once you get your grip around it, then you, you start. Um, you have your meetings with your director. You know, do you have any special vision for this character? I don't quite understand what by what you mean by this, and you know, um, what kind of a hooker are you looking for? You know, <laughs> <laughs> so um, you kind of hash it out with the director, and it's a process. And then um, the sketching f is only for film. I, I actually love doing contemporary. Um, I don't do a lot of period, um, but the sketching comes into play more for period where you're actually having to build costumes mm -hmm. from scratch. Um, for me, doing contemporary is the most challenging in a way, from my point of view, because you really have to be observant about human nature. You have to understand your character and what that character would have gone, what store they would have gone to, mm. what choice they would have made, what was in their closet that morning when they got up, and why did they put on that? And so for me, I find that much more interesting than saying, oh, it's, uh, you know, 1920s, we've got to find a flapper dress, and we've got to put a closed oh, hat on, yes. you know. So. so when you were doing League of Your Own, that was, you did the TV show. Yeah. It had been a film yes. way back when. Yes. Um, did you ignore that? Did you ignore um, the film when you were costuming it? Mm, sort of. But the thing is, actually, Penny Marshall was recreating the film for television. Mm -hmm. So we had all of the same people. I got to use the uniforms from the film. Mm. Um, but that was it. Um, and But we had, you know, Gary Marshall. We had, um, oh, John Lovitz, we had a lot of people from the film. And uh, we went out to Pomona for a week and we shot all the baseball scenes mm -hmm. again. And um, <laughs> it was great fun. Um, and I got to shop in all the great vintage stores in LA. I, I, at the time, there were some fabulous vintage stores. And I go in and I say, show me your best 1940s mm -hmm. outfits. And I would just buy the best that I could buy. and. Um, so uh, it, it was it was great fun. Mm -hmm. But um, and um, Tom Hanks was one of our directors, ah. which was kind of cool. Um, but it didn't make it. It aired three episodes mm -hmm. and then was canned. But uh, cost the Sony a lot of money and kept Penny happy. So who knows? <laughs> so I have a question. So you yeah. started out in the seventies. As a costume designer, as a woman designing for television and film, yeah. um, were, you, were you the only one? No. Okay. Mm -mm. But costume designers generally are women. They, we actually are pretty, pretty divided. There's a lot of men. If you look at the top designers, um, they're, you know, there's the Colleen Atwoods, and then there's the Mark Bridges, and um, it is one area where a lot of women have been able to work. I think because in some people's mind, they say, ah, it's just shopping, and women love to shop, so, you know, how hard can it be? But, but um, shopping and sewing. Uh, no, we don't sew. Oh, you don't sew? You, no. don't make, you don't make costumes? No. Okay. No. Um, on the professional level, um, we've always had very talented workrooms. 
uh, to do the sewing. There's no way doing a TV show that you could possibly right, do right. everything you have to do and also sit at the sewing machine. Right. So um, I've had the benefit of having some wonderful, wonderful tailors and European seamstresses and beaters and um, all of that. So how is diversity now in terms of women being employed uh, in the design fields, not just the costume fields, uh, compared to when you started? Um, I think in terms of costume, it's still pretty equal, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, I, it was, I was thinking about this leading up to this interview, and I was thinking, you know, I started my first show, I was hired by a woman, the head writer and executive producer was a woman. The five leads were women. We had a stage manager who was just the best. She was a woman. And so in sitcoms, there were a lot of women also directors. Mm. Um, so I wasn't as aware of it being, oh, I'm a woman. It's hard for me to get ahead, to be perfectly honest. Um, what I did encounter um, in the 90s was a certain elitism um, from women who were becoming very successful studio executives. And they kept referring to us as below the line. And, you know, it was like, how below? It was below the line. I mean, come on, give me some respect. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember Women in Film was a very big organization mm -hmm. and still is. Um, and I joined and um, went paid my dues, went to the events, and they decided they were going, beside the, the Crystal Awards, they were going to do um, a new award luncheon for all the women who'd been nominated for an Emmy. And I'd been nominated that year, so I was thrilled until I didn't get my invitation. So I said, what's up? They said, oh no, we're not honoring the women below the line. Ooh. Yeah. Well, I made, I gotta tell you though, I made such a fuss, I made a huge fuss. I said, we're all women in film, what the hell is the difference? So I did get my invitation, and then eventually they put me on the board, because I was, you know, squeaky wheel. But... <laughs> so I don't understand, what constitutes below the line? You're a designer, a designer? Well, are... below the line is, is a term in film, um, which is, you know, the budget. You're, your producer and director and writers are above the line, and then all of the sort of the daily hires, if you will, are, are below the line. It's a budget term, but it's, it's used a lot to refer to um, the lower echelon, the, the, mm -hmm. you know, the worker bees. And you know, I, I felt that anyone working in the industry in any area deserved respect. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I mean, that was one area in the early days that it, was, it wasn't so much about getting the job um, and having to fight off all the men who wanted my job. It wasn't that at all, but it was getting the respect. From and women. I, yeah, well for, men. yeah. Um, I mean, I had to share, um, I was doing a pilot and uh, we had production offices and I was sharing my office with the DP and I heard him on the, <laughs> on the phone one day saying, yeah, I can't talk now. I'm uh, sharing my office with a wardrobe girl. Oh. I said, excuse me? <laughs> I said, if you call me the wardrobe girl one more time, I'm calling you the camera boy. <laughs> and it was that kind of, you know, respect that I felt I had to fight for. But I've never um, had to, I believe, fight for a job over a man and, um, as far as salary, um, the union protects us. Mm -hmm. There is the minimum, so we all get the same pay. If you have a good agent or, or a good schmoozer, which I'm not particularly, but um, you can get you know above the base rate. And maybe men have been paid more than me. I don't know, um, but I, I think it's important wherever you are in your career to you know, to tackle the obstacles that are in front of you and not to say, well, back then it was worse or back then it's, mm. or now it's better or now it's not so good. Um, you know, I urge any women to focus more on really being excellent at their job and then dealing with the obstacles as they come up. 
um, because, you know, from a society point of view, I can't really say when was worse and when was better. Costume is probably one of the most important things for most actors. Most every actor I know really appreciates a great collaboration with a costume designer in order to provide them with the tools to build that character. Diana Eden I consider to be the grand dame of Las Vegas costume and wardrobe. Diana Eden is one of the most fabulous people that I know. She is classy, sophisticated, professional, Diana, oh my goodness. She is, I think, an inspiration to so many people. She is a very good friend, has become a very good friend of mine. Oh, isn't she lovely? Isn't she lovely? She is wonderful. She's wonderful to work with. She's Professional, talented. That's all the good adjectives <laughs> we can think of. A beautiful person. I think that's what I like most about her, is you can sit there and have such a great conversation with her. I really enjoy spending time with her as much as I enjoy the beautiful things she makes for me. I've been working with her since uh, I started making short films back around 2007, 2008. And it was, you know, when I was just getting started and I couldn't afford to hire crew or cast or locations or anything, Diana was there to volunteer and she really brought my my beginning productions up to a professional level. Diana and I worked on several short films together and then she was my lead costume designer and wardrobe for Red Herring, which was an independent film we shot here in Las Vegas. Um, and I've worked with her on basically every production I've done since then. So we were introduced to Diana by Mei Mei Long, who uh, produced Popovich and the Voice of the Fable American West. <laughs> Uh, it's a sorry, long title. It's a long yeah. title. I got tired. And uh, we, I mean, we didn't, we didn't know her, so she, you know, uh, we're kind of scrappy, to be honest. I think we're getting better, but back then, especially, we have kind of a feeling of like a lot of buddies in the street, you know, f making it up as we go along. And so uh, when May May mentioned that she would be interested, you know, we checked out her IMDb and we we're like, she's gonna work with us, you know? It was kind of that kind of a feeling. Met her through a friend of a friend and I needed a costume in like two days. And she worked with another seamstress to create an entire costume for me in less than a week. I, I had found Diana's website um, many years back and sent her an email asking her questions about film and television. And she was kind enough to write me back. Time went past and she contacted me to do some renderings for her for a crazy project of tile dresses. My favorite costume that she designed was um, for my uh, holiday show that I did at the Smith Center. It was a beautiful show, 10-piece band, uh, Jubilee Girls came in, a uh, bunch of special guests, and she created this gown that I looked like a gift. It was um, this beautiful cream diamond colored two-piece gown, and it was wrapped all the way around with like 25 foot ribbon and I twirl out of it someone grabs one piece and the whole thing just twirls off and it's so beautiful and I wish I could wear it all the time but Christmas only happens once a year. Disco Dragon. Disco Dragon is a street performer that's in full head-to-toe dragon uh, costume and we we bought we so we bought the costume but we wanted to, the character believes he's a dragon he lives, he lives in it <laughs> from, from morning till night. And so uh, we wanted it to be spruced up and have this disco element to it. So we gave it to her and she just transformed the thing and it's, it's beautiful. She was in uh, the producers, the original one. She was like a beer sign model. And I've watched the movie and I've taken screenshots of the thing and sent to her. I'm like, look, you're in my living room when you were in your 20s, you know? For giving this to Diana, I think you made a great choice and I hope a lot of people can uh, learn from her great example. Congratulations on a very well-deserved award. You're one of my favorite people. You have a wicked sense of humor and uh, I really enjoy being around you and I, I'm really glad that they're honoring you uh, today. I congratulate you on your award. It is well-deserved and we're blessed 
to have you. I just want to say congratulations, Diana, on the award. It was awesome working with you. Well deserved. Very well deserved. Congratulations, Diana. Um, you're the best. Congratulations, Diana. You won! Yeah! <laughs> I am so happy to have the honor and the privilege to uh, present this to you, this oh. beautiful award. I um, have observed you since I've met you, just being a fearless woman who is so talented and kind and just giving of everybody that you come across, that you are just an amazing role model to me. I can't thank you enough, and I'm just amazed that I even know you. So congratulations and congratulations to Diana for, the two, for being the 2018 Nevada Women's Film Festival Women of Achievement. Here's your award. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Oh. Now everybody gets to come up and take a picture with Diana and her award. Whoever wants, we should just line up here. <laughs> Absolutely. Where should we? I'm gonna put this down because it's awkward. It's like yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're so beautiful. Thank you, thank you. Oh, that means so much to me. I, I mean, I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> you deserve it. Oh, man. I don't know. Do I really? <laughs> you do. Look at all the people on the video, and thank oh, you for I all know. those that came out and did the video, and yeah. for helping out and everything. Oh, yeah, the video is, wow, wonderful. And thank you for saying all those nice things. I feel very loved and appreciated. I can't tell you. Thank you. I am blessed. I don't know if my microphone is still on, but I am blessed with amazing friends. Certainly professional friends, but also my, my homies here. I mean, thank you. I love you so much. And all of you that I've worked with for... Oh, well, anyway, I'm just going to go on and on. You've heard enough from me, so thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.